Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. We're all keeping secrets. We're all like putting on a front of, of who we are for people and hiding the, the uglier truths and the, the things that we don't think are worth sharing or shouldn't be shared from each other. There, there isn't a relationship that doesn't have a secret. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Bonaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 43, The Spooky One. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Nova Rensuma about her new book, A Room Away from the Wolves. Nova Rensuma is the author of the New York Times bestselling The Walls Around Us, a finalist for an Edgar Award. Her new novel, A Room Away from the Wolves, is forthcoming September 4th, 2018 from Al Gonquin. She also wrote Imaginary Girls and Seventeen and Gone and is co-creator of Foreshadow, a serial YA anthology. She has an MFA in fiction from Columbia University and teaches at Vermont College of Fine Arts. She grew up in the Hudson Valley spent most of her adult life in New York City, and now lives in Philadelphia. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Read, Learn, Live podcast. I am your host, John Monaster. Hope you're having a wonderful day. And I am delighted to be here with author Nova Rensuma and her book, A Room Away from the Wolves. Hi, Nova. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Ready to talk about the book. Thank you. Good. I'm ready to ask about it. Oh, so many questions. Uh, I don't know. I'm holding this up here, but I have all these tabs. I wrote notes. This book was this book was intense. Um, Thank you. But in a good way. So why don't why don't we just start off and maybe just quickly summarize the book for us? What's it all about? Sure. A Room Away from the Wolves is a ghost story about the tangled bonds between mother and daughter, about complicated female friendship and needing to find a place to belong. The story takes place when my main character, Bina, runs away from home to stay in a boarding house, a refuge for troubled girls deep in the heart of New York City. This is a house of supernatural secrets, living memories, a door to face the past, while all along its founder, Catherine, watches from a framed photograph on the wall above the fireplace. Uh, So during one intense summer month, Bina will discover that her choice to stay or to go may be entirely out of her hands. Ooh, (laughs) there you go. Exactly. Um, So, yeah, knowing that, I like to talk a little bit about the kind of creative process, your writing process first, and then we can kind of get into the actual meat of the book itself, which is full of, like you said, just really interesting things. Um, so yeah, to start off with, what's your writing process like? And I know you've written, uh, other stuff before this, you wrote the walls around us, you know, did your writing process change or do you feel like you've got something that you're kind of sticking with that's worked well for you? Well, I feel like my writing process adapts and, you know, shifts depending on the novel. So this is my fifth novel. And, you know, my fifth published novel, I should say, I have two more living under my bed that are not, yeah. <laughs> that are not finished. Soon, but soon. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, you know, each novel seems to want something different. Usually my process is that I really try and get a handle on what the story is in the first, you know, opening sequence. And mm-hmm. that could be the first 30 pages. It could be the first 50 pages, the first 75 pages. And I spend a lot of time working on that without really having a sense of where I'm going after that, really like 
circling and revising and like working on that first page over and over and over again. And then once I have that, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, there's a click and I'm set free. And then I can really have a sense of what happens next in the story. And then I like le- leap forward and plan ahead and I'll outline the rest of the book. And this has been my writing process that has worked very well for a number of books. But when I tried to, you know, take what I thought I knew and bring it into the writing of A Room Away from the Wolves, I discovered that it wasn't as easy, um, you know, knowing what came ahead. Mm -hmm. So I thought I had a sense of what the story was when I was working on those opening pages. And yet it kept shifting. It kept revealing something new to me. It kept just telling me, oh, no, that's not where I want to begin. I want to begin here. And so this book was a real struggle to nail down the opening moment. And Mm -hmm. I kept rewriting what I thought would be the first chapter. So it, it was, you know, I'd write and I'd even write, you know, I thought what was the full draft and then discover, oh, no, that's not where the book really begins it actually needs this scene. And then I would return to the beginning and then it would change. There would be a ripple effect and it would change everything ahead of it. So my careful planning kind of fell apart and it it, Mm. it involved a lot of discovery redrafting, a lot of drafts. I'm trying to remember how many drafts this book took. I think it was seven. Um, And it was just, it was, it was an intense process of rediscovery and reimagining what I thought the story was. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, do you feel like that, and, and so you're saying that that is very different than what happened before? I mean, what was it about this story that really led to that happening so much? I mean, were you were you personally connected to it? Was it changing in, um, in reference to other people and editors coming back at you? Or was it just kind of your own... Like you'd be on a walk and you'd be like, oh, like I need to go this. Oh, oh, this is how this connects now. I think there are two two parts of this. So the the first part is the outside voices and, you know, the industry and the expectations. Right. Mm. So the book that I had finished before this, The Walls Around Us, it got a lot of attention and it it felt like you know, new readers found me and it it got a lot of really wonderful accolades. And and so the outside forces, the, the pressure of oh, now you have to write something really fantastic next, really brought out a lot of fear and and made me question myself a lot. So I think that that was part of it. I think Mm -hmm. that I was unsure and I was, oh, no, maybe the book should be this. Oh, no, maybe it should be this. And I kept basically changing what I thought I wanted to do here. And then I think the other part of it is that, um, you know, this book, it's a surreal story. It's a ghost story. And there you can say that it takes place in New York City in a boarding house. But you could also say that it takes place somewhere else. You know, there, there, there's not such an easy answer here. And so when I realized that there were, you know, multiple levels of what was real in this story, it really set me off on understanding the book in a different way. And then, you know, new things would emerge. And I realized, oh, no, actually the truth of the story is here and it would veer off into another direction. So in a way it was, you know, the outside voices making me, you know, my own fault for for listening, but then also realizing that the story was deeper and more complex than I had originally thought. Yeah, the story is very complex and I think that's one of the things that makes it so compelling, right? Because you can analyze it and think about it and ponder it in so many different ways. And one of the things that you do is this, you tell the story kind of non-linearly. There's flashbacks. Maybe, you know, it's kind of, sometimes mm-hmm. it's not always clear where Bina is, what time period is, is things are happening, it's, right. which is kind of part of the the, the interest to it. You know, wh- why did you decide that that kind of fragmentation and that style would lend itself to the story? And it seems like from your, your, what I read about your last book, it's it's kind of similar in that you you don't just kind of go from A to Z, you know, is that something Uh, that you find normally happening or or how did that come about? I love that kind of thing, you know, in a story or in a, in a film, like in cinema where we, Mm. we leap ahead and we, we come to this really fraught, exciting moment and we don't fully understand that moment, but we're like caught into the moment and then we back up and see how we got to that moment. I I love that. That just is such like a great hook for me. So I'm Mm -hmm. certainly drawn to that kind of thing in storytelling 
but also just in general for this particular book, so much of it is about memory and, you know, it's Bina's own memories, but also her exploring her mother's memories, almost quite literally, because she goes to this boarding house where her mother had stayed when her when she was 19, right? So it's it, she's exploring, you know, memories that weren't her own and she's making them her own. And memory doesn't come in order, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, you know, in an organized manner, it comes in pieces, it comes, you know, in, you know, ways we don't understand it, time swirls and strange patterns. And so it felt natural to do some of that in the storytelling of this book. I don't think I could have made it work just in a linear fashion from, you know, beginning to end in the same way. I don't think it would be the same experience. Yeah, so that's a great point that our our lives, our experience of, of going through our lives is not linear necessarily. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, even now, like, I remember things so vividly from my childhood and when I was a teenager, and I can't remember exactly what happened last week. You know, like, the yeah, things that, yeah, that there, there you are, know, certain are more impressions. Prominent. Right. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I love exploring that that idea, especially in a in a book about, you know, someone who is at that, that edge of, you know, turning turning into an adult being is is 17 you know yeah i I think that's a great um connection so let's talk about bina you know at the at the beginning of the book we're introduced to you know your your protagonist bina so who is she at the beginning what's her situation well we find we start the story with bina standing on the side of the road in her small upstate town she has a suitcase and she has a black eye and she's thumbing for a ride You know, she wants to get out. Something's happened to her. She's been, you know, beat up. She's running away. And she's leaving, you know, a whole series of mistakes behind. And so we're beginning at a place where she's at a low point. She's broken. She doesn't know, like, what's, you know, what's possible next in the world for her. Her mother has kicked her out of the house. Uh, But there's this hope that she's carrying that something you know, might be discovered and transformed and, and, and possible in this place that her mother always used to speak about when she was a child, which is New York City. You know, her mother had, you know, basically created this mythical imagined place for Bina when she was young of, you know, one day we'll, we'll both run away to New York City. And she remembered the stories her mother would tell of when she was young in New York City. And she just thought like, you know, everything would change if only they would just make it there but they never made it there together. So now we're beginning with Bina deciding um, she has nothing else at home and she's going to go there on her own. Mm. And yeah, talking about her mother, you know, you have this line early on about Bina and her mom. I was in, you say, I was in the room right in front of her and she couldn't see me. And I thought that was um, just kind of encapsulated it all right there. I mean, what does that mean? What happened to their relationship? How how did everything change when Bina and her mom left her dad and then ended up moving in with this this new family? Yeah, I think, you know, there was something about Bina and her mother's relationship that was just incredibly close when it was just the two of them. Even when they were with, you know, Bina's father, he was a, a violent man. He was a, you know, an, an un, unhappy man who was abusive to her mother. And so the, the, the mother and daughter bonded and had this, you know, uh, what she thought was an unbreakable bond together. But then when they were just about to to run away and move to the city, leaving Dina's father, you know, things little things turned because they were, you know, picked up on the side of the road. They were hitchhiking. They were picked up on the side of the road by a very nice man with two daughters who said, hey, come and, you know, come and stay with us for a while. And that ended up being uh, Bina's mother's new husband and her future stepsisters. So it's like her her life kind of veered off course. It was like, you know, this ab- abrupt, like, you know, needle off the record, like suddenly, oh, no, you're not going anywhere. You're right here. And here's your new life. And this is your new family. And I think that that abrupt shift really rocked something uh, in with Bina and her mother's relationship. So when we meet them years later, when Bina's a teenager, because that happened when she was a child, um, Bina's mother is, you know, her loyalties, at least in Bina's mind, her loyalties are in question because she's kind of siding with the stepsisters and with her husband. And Bina feels completely adrift and alone. So when she's looking at her mother and saying, you know, she doesn't see me, it's like she's, she can't see 
you know, who her own, she thinks that she can't see who her own daughter is anymore. And all she can see is just this life of this, you know, this, this other family and this other person her mother has almost become. It feels like the greatest betrayal in the world. Mm. Yeah, that, that betrayal, I think, then connects to everything else that happens in the rest of the book in, in some way. And yeah, just th- just I remember reading about her relationship with the rest of the family. I, I mean, I, I think like Cinderella or something kind of came to mind, yeah. right? Like she had these like these like the definition of wicked stepsisters that are just so <laughs> cruel to her. Um, and I, I mean, why do you think that is? Why is it so hard to integrate families like that? I mean, why are our children just naturally predisposed to hating someone that comes in that, you know, wasn't from their birth parents or? Yeah. I mean, I, I had, you know, I had a bit of a blended family and didn't have this experience, but I, I see, um, there was just something maybe, uh, that made the sis, the stepsisters, the two sisters who were around Bina's age, maybe mm. it made them feel threatened to see this relationship that Bina had with her mother, that it was so incredibly close. The, gr- the girls, their mother had died. They had lost their mother. They had their father. But like here was this new woman who just shows up in their house uh, with, a, with, a ki- with a kid and is like, here's your new sister. And I think that, you know, there was there was a chance to, you know, want to maybe cause a rift, but also to want to have a connection with Bina's mother and then Bina felt threatened. And I just I don't think that the balance could have been dealt with in a healthy way, at least in this family. And I think so much of it happened because it was so incredibly sudden. It was just like they picked this this lady and her kid up on the side of the road, and then there she moved in. This is the new family. And I mm. think that that was part of it here. Yeah, there wasn't really any like courting period where they could no. gently get to know each other. It was sort of like, <laughs> okay, we're living together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, Bina ends up telling herself that she really needs to go where she isn't wanted if she expects things to change. And I thought that was a really interesting turn of phrase. I mean, why is that? And maybe yeah, if you have any personal experience or if, if you were drawing from personal experience in terms of places you've gone where you weren't wanted. I think maybe when, you know, and also in saying that somewhere where she wasn't wanted, I feel like Bina feels like she's not wanted anywhere. You know, and and so she doesn't belong anywhere. She's not. No one wants her there. You know, everyone hates her because she's. She really is starting off the story in a, in, at a point where people are really, you know, not a fan of Bina, right? So she, in order to to push herself and to do something, you know, different in her life and to change um, and to grow, she needs to put herself in an uncomfortable place in a place where she doesn't feel like she's wanted or, um, you know, fits in. And I, you know, personally, that's something that, that is really hard, but something that I do find that when I do do that, something often comes of it. When I do the things that I'm most afraid of, you know, and I go the places that, that scare me the most, um, in terms of, you know, with my writing career or, you know, my teaching career or something involving, you know, in my life, that's often the time when something really transformative happens. And I look back and I think, oh, that really was the right choice. You know, mm-hmm. that really was the, the, the thing to do that, that scared me. And I think Bina is just scared that no one will want to, you know, will like her or want to be around her. That's what scares her. And she needs to to put herself out there and find out, which is what she does when she moves to this whole new boarding house full of strangers. Yeah, she really does. <laughs> she definitely takes <laughs> that leap. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about Catherine House as as you know when she gets there, then you know dominates the book, uh, <laughs> literally the house itself. And you know uh, what is Catherine House? What does it what does it mean to Bina? Well, Catherine House, uh, you know, first of all, it's a it's a boarding house uh, for young women only, and it's in New York City. New York City. There used to be a number of these boarding houses in in Manhattan and in Brooklyn, in New York. They've kind of like faded out of existence, but they used to exist for you know young young professionals to come into the city and and try an internship or a job or to study at a university. And so um, you know, in researching the history of 
you know, parts of, of the city, I was very inspired by that. But then I, of course, imagined things a little more ghostly, you might say. Yeah, so, so, I would definitely you know, say. Yeah. So for Bina, you know, it's it's this place that, I mean, for her, because she knew that her mother once stayed there and the mystery of, you know, she knew all she knew is that her mother had the happiest time of her life when she was staying and renting a tiny little room, uh, you know, in Catherine House. And she doesn't know why her mother left. She doesn't know why that happy time you know, ended right away. She's, this is a mystery to her that she's trying to unravel. And so it's almost like her going to this place. She wants what her mother had, but she also wants to find out the answers that her mother has kept from her. And the longer she stays, the longer she discovers that there are more secrets, um, magical and otherwise that her mother never, ever told her about involving Catherine house. So, you know, that's, it's a, it's a dreamlike place, but it's also, you know, a place again of, of Bina's mother's memories. And it's a place full of, of possibility for Bina for, you know, a, a time, an opportunity for her to absolutely transform. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned secrets. One of the things that Bina had to do before she was kind of allowed in is it was a lot of stuff, but one of them was this vow of secrecy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the woman that's running the boarding house, Miss Ballantine, kind of is very serious about this. You must take this vow of secrecy before you're allowed to live there. And, uh, you know, I was kind of struck by that. And I just wanted to find out from you maybe what you thought the reason was. You know, why is it that secrets are so important to us? And how do they hold the house together? Mm -hmm. How do they bind the girls and Miss Ballantine and maybe even Catherine all together? I always, you know, there's always that, that thing of, of wondering the person who's closest to you, you know, what secrets are they really keeping from me? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, with Bina, the, the secrecy here is that she knew her mother stayed in this place. She never knew anything about this vow of silence and this secrecy, you know, this, the, this vow that, you know, you can only share what happens within this house with, you know, your, your direct descendants, your daughters, right. Your, your, you know, like women who are connected to you and your family. And her mother has never shared any of this with her that she soon discovers is happening in the house. And so it's almost like, you know, it's this, this secret that is an even greater betrayal than her, than her mother kicking her out of the house. I personally love writing about that, that deep dark, dark secret that's, you know, kept between two close characters or the secret that basically, you know, explodes everything in, in your mind and you re rediscover everything you thought you knew was real is, is not at all, you know, <laughs> what you imagined. Um, so it's just what a fun, interesting thing to explore. And I also think, you know, maybe in exploring it, I'm, I'm thinking about just like reality and life, we're all keeping secrets. We're all like putting on a front of, of who we are for people and hiding the, the uglier truths and the, the things that we don't think are worth sharing or shouldn't be shared from each other. There, there isn't a relationship that doesn't have a secret. Mm. Food for thought. <laughs> so, so, you know, Bina's mom lived at Catherine House. Bina ended up there too. You know, like you mentioned at the beginning, Bina and her mom once had a really close relationship, but it, you know, sort of fell apart. And, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons why she wanted to leave. So it's, it was really interesting to me that the relationship was, you know, turned sour, but she still kind of wanted to follow in her mom's footsteps, or that still seemed like the best plan to her was going where her mom went. So I was just about, or I just wanted to ask about why, why that happened still. You know, I, I guess for me, mm -hmm. like, that's not, that's the, like, that's not the path I would have followed. You know, yeah. where I thought, okay, like, I hate my mom. She was associated with this place. I'm not going to go to this place because I hate my mom. Um, but I guess for some reason, the, that entanglement maybe drew Bina there or somehow keeping, keeping that, keeping Catherine House of interest to her. I mean, why, why, why do you think that was? Mm -hmm. I mean, you would, you would think that like her mother has betrayed her. 
you know, she's she's heartbroken and that the last thing she would want is any kind of connection to, to this person. You know, she just she just she would not want to do anything that her mother had done before. You know, and I think that's something that, you know, you know, teenagers, we rebel. Um, not that I'm a teenager anymore, but I certainly remember. Right. I remember, yeah. you know, rebelling and not wanting to to do what my mom did and, and not wanting to, you know, wanting to separate myself and wanting to be some completely on my own. And so, you know, when I was writing this book, originally, that's what, you know, I was thinking, like, why is it so important for Bina to go to this place when instead of going something, going somewhere completely fresh, where her mother would never find her. And I think Mm -hmm. it's because of that, that unfinished business that's left when her mother, like, brings the suitcase to her door and says, you know, you need to leave. It's just, Bina really wants her mom to to take that back and to find her. And I, I think that there's something really interesting to explore between a, a, a teenage girl and her mother, that, that tangled relationship. You know, as I said mm-hmm. at the beginning, it's not, it, it may be this like close bond perhaps when you're young, but it gets really complicated when you're, a, you know, an older teenager about to head off onto your own. Like it is not easy and, and it's it's something really rich and, you know, fascinating to explore. So that was the question that I posed to myself. And I really think that, you know, Bina has this unfinished piece with her mother. She needs some kind of closure. And in a way, even though her mother would have no idea where she and where she went, right? She she's trying desperately to reach out to her even if her mother can't even hear it. Mm. So you you know you like you mentioned this is a an all woman boarding house and I'm not f- too familiar with the history in New York, but I was just really curious about why it was important to you or to you know maybe Ka- you know, Bina or Bina's mom that you know the Catherine House be only for women you know men not be allowed. So w- why why were boarding houses set up this way or why was Catherine House set up this way and you know how important is it? to create a safe space here where, where men aren't allowed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, I mean, that's comes from real history. And I think that's where, why Catherine house existed, um, you know, as, as it is, as a boarding house for young women is because I was reading, you know, you know, I used to live in New York city. So I was reading just about the place where I'm, where I'm, where I lived, where my family's from, where, you know, generations of my family were, were from. And just, I came across this article in an old issue, it was online, but it, would, it was published in an old issue of The Village Voice about this boarding house that I think was, at, when I was reading it, it was about to close or something, it was about the closing. It was called Catherine House, but it was spelled with a K. And it was um, in, in, on a, in another part of the village. So it was like, I think it was maybe on 10th or 12th Street. I can't remember, it's not where mine is. but um, And it was a house just for Protestant young women to come and you know have a room to rent, a, a safe refuge in the city, and that just really stuck with me. And of course, you know, in my in my own imagination of it, it's no longer just for Protestant women, and it still exists today. Where you know, I think in the '90s is when these things you know mostly closed down, and it 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 is a place where you know, there would be like the why in, in, in the city where you would have as a young woman, a place to, to stay where there was the, at least the appearance of safety because no men were allowed inside the building. And so in the, the real Catherine house, the one that existed years ago, there used to be a, like a, a parlor room where the, where male visitors, male callers could come <laughs> and visit and they weren't allowed upstairs and they were only allowed in this room during certain hours of the day. And I remember reading about that and just being like, oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. My story kind of veered, you know, into just really focusing on the girls in the house and on the woman who was running it and on the woman who founded it, um, the, the original Catherine. And I just, you know, went off into um, new depths with that. But I think, you know, for me, a lot of my stories really focus on just the relationship of girls and women to each other. And that's just really what I love exploring and writing about. You know, my previous book took place in an all-girls juvenile detention center. So now we're doing a a girls 
boarding house, you know, what's next? I don't know. <laughs> but it's All just, girls, it's space station. I know we're Bring space on. station. Now we're doing science. Yeah, who knows? But I just, it's just something I really, really love exploring. And so, you know, the real reason is just, I was just so excited by the discovery that this was a real place and that, you know, what could I do with this story and what might happen in a place like this? Yeah. And so thinking about everyone, all the women at Catherine House, they, they all sort of end up there for different reasons. But Bina really connects with this girl, Monet, early on. So, you know, who is she? And, and why is it that Bina is able to connect with her uh, on such a deeper level, seemingly, than the other girls? Uh, well, I don't want to give anything away, but I will okay. say that... Um, say Monet, as much as you can. <laughs> yeah. Monet is Bina's downstairs neighbor. So she has the room directly below Bina's in the boarding house, these tiny little, you know, matchbox size rooms. And Monet is just a complete and total enigma to uh, Bina. She's just a mystery. And, you know, which... Bina is fascinated by, but also there are just little, little pieces and little clues and stuff where, you know, Monet is really almost the, the opposite of Bina. She, she, or a better version of her. It's like, she's everything that, that Bina wishes that she could be. Bina is, you know, called at the beginning of the story, a liar. You know, we hear that she, she, she's lied about things to her mother and, and been called out on her untruths. But for example, Monet is a great liar. Monet is, a, you know, spins stories and everyone believes her. Monet is like the liar that Bina wishes she could be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just, it's almost like a mirror image between, between them. But one side of the mirror is a little more, you know, favorably, yeah. <laughs> favorably framed. So there was just something really, really interesting to to explore between Monet and Bina and, you know, who, who Bina wanted to be and projecting that onto this other person. But then there's also, uh, you know, as this book is, has many layers and many possibilities. And as I tell all my readers, there is never a wrong answer and there is never a wrong interpretation. You know, Monet also has a lot of similarities with Bina's mother. You know, there's, there's talk of, you know, sometimes she has like the same hair color as her, as her mother did. And her mother, when she stayed in the house, used to dye her hair a lot. And, um, you know, Bina's mother was, wanted to be an actress and, and, you know, was, had a way of, of lying and, and transforming a story and, and performing that Monet also does. And so there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's the connection there that you could follow that trail and, and see how those little pieces stick together. So I think Monet is certainly a fascinating character to Bina for a number of reasons. And it was just, you know, for me, I'll tell you one of the, uh, the inspirations for Monet just in general was um, the novella Breakfast at Tiffany's. Mm. And just the, the, you know, there's this upstairs neighbor fascinated by this mysterious enigma of a downstairs neighbor. And that to me is, that's the seed of where Monet began. And that's, um, you know, everything that, that follows the, the fascination and, and the passion that, that Bina has for really trying to figure her out and, and nail her down and, and discover who she is. Yeah. I think that that's really fascinating to me in terms of thinking about the personalities that are inside of us, you know, like you talked about having your kind of your best self in a way and thinking about what that might look like and then comparing that to, you know, the way that we present ourselves and it's, there's, there's just all these different facets to it. So yeah, that's, that's a, Really interesting way of thinking about that character, um, you know. And then at, at one point in the book, you know, she invites Bina to this French restaurant, and you know, is really sweet and just tells Bina she'll pay, she'll cover it, and then Bina really starts to open up in a way that she hasn't opened up to anybody else in the entire book. And and Monet is eating the whole time, and it was just really like that scene was just a, really interesting. It was just fascinating to me. And, you know, later on, it seems like Bina felt really embarrassed. And I won't give away too much about what happened in the scene, but to me, it was really interesting to, to think about why she might be ashamed about her life. Because all, everyone at Catherine House has something. You know, they, they all came because of a reason. You, you get bits and pieces from some of the different girls there about, you know, what, what ended them, what, what, you know, allowed them to, or what forced them maybe to, to come there. 
why do you think Bina is is still ashamed of her story and you know tells it kind of once all the way through and then feels bad about even that afterwards mm-hmm. i mean i think i really loved writing that french restaurant scene because yeah. really it's, it's it's almost as if you know monet is like eating the whole time and it's almost also she's eating bina's stories like she's just yeah. like so hungry for everything uh, and bina gives her everything i mean she just tells her everything i think you know why why is bina embarrassed about you know her story Catherine house is a refuge for troubled girls and we get little pieces of why other people ended up there a lot of them were in some like real trouble you know real like real danger and i think for bina she's feeling that her her what led her there isn't enough that like Mm. her her story just oh her mom kicked her out of the house oh some girls are mad at her you know and like chased her through the woods um you know this this isn't enough and i you know maybe as if you know her trouble isn't large enough and she's not, you know, worthy of being there. And I think that's part of the embarrassment for her and the sense of like her story is small, but I think everyone's, you know, what I'm hoping to communicate here is everyone's trouble and, and story is, is, is worthy. And, you know, the girl who feels like she's not good enough and she's not wanted and she's not, you know, she just makes mistake after mistake. And, you know, what is the point that that low point where someone could reach? I wanted to speak to that girl and, you know, show this other, you know, this light at the end of the tunnel in, in mm. the book. So one of the other things uh, and that we haven't really talked about is Bina's father and, you know, Bina's father, her original birth father, you know, her mom and and being a fled because of, you know, all sorts of bad things were happening. And, and Bina's father has an art studio in New York or an art gallery in New York. And Bina just sort of wanders and seemingly wanders her way there. And, you know, and, 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 you know, Monet ends up with her. And so what was that meeting like? What's it like in that situation for Bina? Well, she, you know, she hasn't seen her father in years and years. And the last time she saw him, he was just completely disinterested in her and just, you know, like cruel to her mother, cruel to her and just, you know, not at all what she wanted of him. And so it's almost, you know, she it's almost like she subconsciously makes her way to the place where she knew she would find him to have, again, some closure. But it's not like he's going to be anything that she wants him to be now. It's not like he's going to turn, you know, magically into the the father she always hoped she had and swoop in and like save her and, and protect her and take care of her. He's a terrible disappointment. And it's, it's everything her mother had warned her about, about wanting to, you know, reconnect with him. When she, when she talks to her mother about wanting to be in the city, her mother's like, Oh no, you shouldn't go stay with him. You know, he'd ne- he wouldn't want you. He wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be there. And so it's, it, every, everything comes to fruition in that moment when Bina sees this man that she hasn't seen in so long and sees that actually, yes, he is not anything that she had wanted him to be. You know, no, not to get too personal, but I think that a lot of, you know, a lot of my own, um, you know, emotions and uh, experiences with my own father are really, sh- you know, shoved into that scene and really like fraught and like put put there because, I don't know, I mean, that's something that's haunted me as much as, you know, a lot of the things in this book are, are little pieces that have haunted me, but I couldn't imagine Bina's story having any like finality or any closure without having confronted that part of her past and this this man and letting go of him she needed to let go of him and this visit to the art gallery where he shows his true colors um, absolutely allows her to let go and turn her back and never look back Mm. so I kind of want to finish up by asking about some of the stranger things that happen in the book and you can, you know, let on or respond with as little or as much as necessary to keep, keep people in suspense. Cause you know, there is stuff that you want to just read about, but you know, one of the things that is just very clear during the whole course of the book is that Catherine house is weird and strange and creepy and you know, all those odd, whatever adjectives you want to use, you know, just strange things are happening constantly. And you know, it, like just even at breakfast, it's not really clear where breakfast is coming from. You know, what what's going on? It's just 
Like she never really sees anyone serving or cooking breakfast. You just put it in order and food shows up. And it's, <laughs> you know, or Catherine herself is, is kind of, Catherine's there in this picture frame, like you mentioned, and that she seems to move and change and shift and stare and, and have some direct connection to Bina. And it's, it's all very bizarre. And, you know, Bina has a very interesting reaction to it, I think, you know, I, how is it that Bina is dealing with this reality that she's presented with, you know, and how, how might that be different from what people might normally do? Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's certainly something going on in Catherine house. Once you open that gate and step in, something shifts and change and changes and what even is really happening there, you know, is that house even in existence, you know, is the big question. Yeah. But I mean, I think you, there's, there's a ghostly there's a ghostly aspect to the story centered on the the woman in the picture frame who is Catherine, who this house had originally been hers. And she, after she dies in a mysterious accident, um, you know, the house is then gifted to um, an estate that is running it for, you know, young women to stay in. And so I just, I think for me, I can't imagine writing about, a place in New York city without thinking about all the layers of history and, you know, just even like walking a corner and like thinking of just like all the many things that had crossed that corner and occurred there and that are then like wiped out and like something else steps in and takes its place. And it's just one of the things I love so much about the city. So when I imagine this place, I imagine the past as, as active and urgent as the present. And so that comes through in the girls who are staying there in the portrait on the wall that seems to eye being a, you know, wherever she moves in the room to, you know, the portraits on the stairwell of all the girls who used to stay there. So there's, there's something about it that, um, just puts Bina in an unsettled, precarious position from the very beginning, which I feel like speaks to her mental state. And it feels, it speaks to her fears of what might happen if she moved to the city, uh, her fears of what might happen if she were on her own, and then also if her mother found her and if she were able to have that reconnection with her mother. You know, if you know, if we just imagine her like racing through all those thoughts and having all those fears, it's almost as if these fears have taken on, you know, faces and bodies and 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 are moving around, you know, independently of her now in this house. And so that that's so much of it. But also, um, you know, I'm just someone who loves a good ghost story, but I also get very frightened. <laughs> of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I was um, I was away at a writer's colony uh, when I was um, after I'd finished writing the walls around us, I was writing another book and it was in a in an old house. And if you know, there were quiet hours during the day and I would go down during the quiet hours and I would pace the carpet in front of this portrait of the woman whose house it was. Her name was Katrina, not Catherine, but um, very and close, we <laughs> were very close, but I swear it was watching me as what? I was like, I like, it's just, you know how portraits like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. follow you, but you know, when you're a writer, your imagination kind of like gets the best of you. So there is a lot of the real house that I stayed in, in this book. And actually, when I was I went to this colony to work on a totally different novel. And I ended up switching gears, putting that novel in a drawer and starting this novel. So it felt like something happened in the experience of being there that not only was I just inspired by the house itself, and that feeling of being watched and that feeling of like strange possible things happening. Um, but also, you know, I was compelled to, to change and, and tell the story that, that went deeper than that, that that was just like the surface piece of it, but there was something wanting to be told here and it was the time to tell it. So all of that is wrapped up into, you know, the strange occurrences that happen in the story too. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's some great background right there. <laughs> what a spooky place to have a writer's colony. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess productive. I mean, that's great that you right. were able to then use that kind of energy that you felt and right. um, and write the book. So I, I want to just wrap it up with a couple of quick questions here. Uh, so I love the title of the book, A Room Away from the Wolves. And, you know, I thought a bit about that 
you know, like who who are the wolves here? You know, Bina locks her door a lot and seemingly doesn't want people to come in and you know and she's she's escaping seemingly from men they can't come in maybe the other girls can't come in i, I don't know I, I was just trying to understand better you know who who are the wolves here who are being as wolves and and do we kind of have our our own wolves that will that you know maybe we need to build places to keep out yeah i mean i think we all have our own wolves don't we i mean so the the title is based on a quote from Good Morning Midnight by Jean Rhys. It's a room is a place where you hide from the wolves outside and that's all any room is. And that, you know, that story takes place in a, you know, I think she was staying at a hotel or a boarding house somewhere in Paris and the the wolves for that character were completely different. But I was just really taken by that quote and the idea of, you know, anyone against you is are the wolves, right? Like mm. and and sometimes you get to that that place, that fragile place where it feels like everyone's against you and it feels like there were wolves surrounding you and they're about to you know just like voraciously attack you right and it feels like that when you're in a really really low place so for for Bina I think that the wolves are everyone at home that wants her gone it's those girls who were chasing her through the woods it's her it's her own family you know it's it's you know it becomes her her father who didn't want her it's it's everyone who is you know not on her side and I think, you know, I do think that we all imagine that we have, you know, those people who are against us, who are who are our, our wolves. And I, I think when I'm, you know, when I talk about this book, I sometimes have to be like, there are no actual wolves in the story. Right, <laughs> right. Know, it's just, a metaphor, just, everybody. Just eye, eye, you yeah. If you're, if you're expecting a book about wolves, this is not it. <laughs> but, you know, the wolves are, are, are figurative and, you know, are our, you know, our fears, you know, as, as much as, you know, everything inside us can, can be our worst enemy, you know, the wolves can be anything. And it's just a matter of, of finding a way to get beyond that and to just live, you know, for yourself in a positive way beyond that. And I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm reaching toward that with Bina. Um, and, you know, just even, you know, as a, as a writer, as artists, as creative people, like hearing, you know, our own wolves, our own, our own doubts, our own fears of like, what, what could possibly happen, you know, if we, if we write this, or if we don't write this, you know, we're all fighting against that. And I, I personally was fighting against that when I was writing this book. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> la- layers upon layers, upon yeah. layers, upon layers. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that kind of wraps up what I had. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Is there anything else about the book that you hoped people would get or any ideas or anything beyond that? I mean, I love the questions that you you asked me and how deeply, you know, we've talked about it. I mean, I hope that this is a book that that finds the readers who love, you know, a ghost story, but also at the same time, this isn't a traditional ghost story. This is more, you know, it's like a psychological twisting of a story. And so I hope that it, it just finds readers who are looking for, you know, you know, a deep self-exploration, a sense of escape, and that, you know, people who like things creepy, but also people who like things that that get them twisted up and get keep them thinking at the end. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's that's all I'm I'm hoping that that comes of this. <laughs> okay. Well, that sounds great. Good hopes. Um, so the the question that everybody asks. Um, What's next? What's happening? What are you working on? Uh, it, it can be a vacation, but it sounds like you've got a couple drafts lying around somewhere. What, what are you up to? Uh, well, I do have some old drafts, but I'm I'm leaving them under the bed for the yeah. for the moment. Um, let them well, sit. One, crew yeah, interest. Let, let them sit. Yeah, they're not ready. But I, the one project that I do want to talk about is I'm starting a place to publish YA short fiction online. Uh, there are very few venues for publishing YA short stories. And this is a great passion of mine. I love short stories and I wanted to offer this opportunity to other writers. So myself and my partner, my co-editor in this project, Emily XR Pan, a fellow YA author, and I have started Foreshadow, a serial YA anthology. And everyone should go check us out at foreshadowya.com. Starting in 2019, we'll be publishing three new YA short stories a month. 
Ooh. And we have a new, uh, our debut issue is online right now, issue zero, and it features three really stellar stories. And so that is the thing that I, that I want to be thinking oh, about that's in the so future exciting. and not yeah. the novel that's sitting on my desk that needs to be written. <laughs> no, no worries. You've got, you've got all of that ahead of you. That's so exciting. Yeah. So yeah. you're kind of taking it, taking publishing into your own hands. Yeah, I mean, there just there wasn't a venue. There isn't an op- there wasn't as many opportunities, and not just for you know like someone like me to publish my YA stories. I can put those in, in in anthologies. There aren't as many venues for new voices for unpublished writers who are writing YA fiction in general. And mm-hmm. I just you know I, that's how I began. I had my stories published in literary journals years ago, and that was my first open door. And so Emily and I really wanted to to have to offer this open door to other writers. And so we've created this project to do just that. Oh, that's great. I wish you all the luck. Thank you. All right, so let's do a thunder round. I'm gonna ask you three quick questions okay. and then we're gonna call it a day. Sound good? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. What is your favorite food and or drink? A sesame bagel toasted um, with tofu cream cheese from New York City. Okay. <laughs> just because the bagels everywhere else are not as good. Fair. <laughs> You're going to have to drive a little bit for that, right? but uh, maybe I can grab one and send it to you. We'll see. <laughs> uh, um, where's your favorite place you've ever been? You know, I would say New York, but there's some place that I go where I teach a workshop every year. It's in Northern California. It's called the Jurassic Resident Artist Program in um, Woodside, California, up a mountain overlooking the Pacific Ocean mm. with um, sculpture trails where artists have left behind work in the woods and just like the sense of creativity. And whenever I'm there, I just feel like this is the most extraordinary place in the world. So I will say Jurassic in California. <laughs> that sounds beautiful. I'm it's, from California. I have never heard of it beautiful. or been there. So. You should visit. Everyone I should go to. visit. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, all right, last question. If you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? Uh, not to get too political, but I would change, you know, the course of where we are right now in the world in this country. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. you can, it's, it's, it's totally fair. Yeah. yeah. It's your magic wand. Yes, it's my magic all right. wand. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been so wonderful. I'm so glad to talk with you. Uh, the author, again, Nova Rensuma, her book, A Room Away from the Wolves, is on sale September 4th. That is so soon. So soon. I, so soon from everywhere and anywhere. So go out and buy it because this book was great. Thanks again for coming on, Nova. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for these great questions. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. 